Building Coordinator for the Holmes County Chamber of Commerce, and this is Chats with the Chamber Lady. And today, I want to welcome my guest, uh, John Tate, Sheriff of Holmes County for the past seven years. Uh, John, how are you doing I'm tonight? doing great. Um, we are so fortunate to have you uh, on Chats with the Chamber Lady. And uh, our county is very f fortunate to have you uh, in, in the role as sheriff. And um, your actions speak louder than words. And uh, we, we can see your action all over our county. So uh, just thank you for your dedication and your service and your department's service and dedication. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity to come on tonight to speak to you. And uh, I get a lot of credit for the work, but it's mm -hmm. the people who work with me that make me shine. So I, I can't take all the credit, but I appreciate it. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started with our questions tonight. And uh, we're going we're gonna to start by asking you about the remodeling of the old Ag Center on Highway 90. And uh, that's going to be the new uh, administrative offices for the Sheriff Department. And I know that you've done this as a, as a huge cost savings to our county as well. Yes, ma'am. Uh, it all started uh, probably about a year or two, two years ago in, in the talks with the commissioners and things. I uh, uh, was fortunate enough at Holmes County. We had uh, Senator Gaynor and uh, Representative Gradrake help okay. us with uh, ensure a uh, appropriations from the state to build a new ag center and also within the ag center uh they was going to build a, a government efficiency center for the sheriff's office and ems and there was some talks we just kind of i talked to them about what they was going to do with the old ag center that mm -hmm. i would be interested in remodeling it uh, for a sheriff's office because that would fit our needs and uh graciously enough they agreed and voted to let me do that um you already have maybe a target date that uh, you're going to be opening the facility? Yeah, we're, we're hoping to be in it by the end of July. Uh, things are moving forward. Uh, we'll have, uh, I have three employees that are on my payroll that work with the work crews and stuff that are kind of heading it up, and they do a really great job with the electricity and just the building part. Uh, probably so far we've only had to sub out 25 percent of the work rest of the 75 percent of the work has been done by inmates and employees that's that's outstanding yeah um just a number what what do you think the cost savings to our, um, our county will they allowed be? me 750 thousand to do the renovations <laughs> mm -hmm. and as of today we've spent 250 thousand that's just amazing and we're probably and we're in the stages of now of uh painting the sheetrock and the only things we like left is the finishing, uh, painting the sheetrock, and putting the floor and stuff down. So I figure around 400, 450,000 is probably what we have in it when we're done. Uh, and we'll be able to save probably 350, 400,000. Okay, it's just wonderful. Um, now, uh, moving on, I would like for maybe you to share a little bit about the success of your rehab programs uh, for the inmates of this county. Uh, I mean, you you believe in in stopping that that cycle right. uh, w with with uh, the inmates. So, just li let's hear all about the rehab program. Well, I've been in law enforcement for 25 years, and I, you know, uh, most of my career I've worked narcotics. That was my forte. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, in early in my career, I, you know, I, I was. Uh, very active and l put a lot of people in jail but over the years you, you realize uh that's not really solving the problem that we have uh just by putting them in jail mm -hmm. um and then you know probably about 10 years ago uh we really got started in far as trying to rehabilitate and get uh into the rehabilitation part of it and uh when i got elected sheriff i brought staff on board to uh help facilitate that and now we have two two staff members that help kind of facil facilitate the rehab part, part. Uh, but it goes hand in hand. I always tell people you can't rush arrest your way out of a drug problem, but arrest is part of the rehabilitation problem. Um, we always hope that people who are addicts will seek help before they get in trouble, but a lot of times that doesn't happen. I mean, it, it usually takes them going to jail maybe one or more times mm -hmm. to realize, you know, hey, i got a problem, I need help. Mm -hmm. And Half the battle is getting them to the jail to realize they got a problem. Right. Uh, as long as they're out here in the world running around and be able to get their hands on drugs, mm -hmm. most of them won't see that they have an issue. Yeah. Um, they think they can take care of it on their own and everybody else is just crazy. And then, you know, But once they get locked up and they're confined into a cell and have time to sober up and start looking at their life, mm -hmm. they realize, hey, you know, 
I need to do something. I need to change. And then we have people that step in uh, through the community and at our office mm-hmm. will help facilitate, you know, talk to them and say, hey, you know, I've been where you're being and, you know, there is help out there and you can do it and you can overcome it. And here, I'm going to give you some resources. This is what, you know, is available. Mm-hmm. And then basically uh, we try to hook them up with a rehab facility and get them accepted somewhere. Mm-hmm. Then we forward that information to our state attorney's office. And they review it, and if they're a candidate to get to go to rehab, mm-hmm. uh, they will work <laughs> with the judges and stuff and sentence them to rehab versus, uh, versus probation going. or prison. Could you maybe give us an example of, of a success story? Um, yeah, I, I, got, I got several. Uh, okay. I, I'll give you one that popped off my head because she came to see me the other day at the office. Okay. Um, I had I, we had a friend who was a uh, kind of like a fellow employee who was on our reserves. Mm-hmm. He comes to me one time. His sister had a drug problem, and we was able to send people down there to talk to her, and was able to convince her and talk to her and got her into a rehab program. And this has been seven years ago. And she come by to see me the other day. She's graduated the program. She stayed on and done two or three years. She's now married. Uh, she's got a step kid. She's working. She's doing great. And she and she come home to see him and her and her father come by and her husband come by and see me and just do just tell basically say thank you. And just look at the difference that that, that has made into her uh, in her life and right. her family. And it's not only just that, but her uh, as a whole, because when she come and visited, there was a girl that we have a, a orderly trustee at the office. Uh-huh. She was down there at a program with her and she was able to connect back with her and you know, talk to her and show show her that, hey, you know, I've made it, uh, you know, I've turned my life around, you can too. And it just encourages other people to be able to see yes. there's hope out there. Mm-hmm. And, and, and sometimes that's all that individual needs is just to know that, that, that they can change. Right, they can. And, uh, you know, so, so many times they feel like when, when they're in that hole with the attic, they feel like they can't get out. Mm-hmm. And they feel like, you know, there's really no hope, but you know, I always tell people, as long as you're breathing, there's hope. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you for 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 providing those programs, and and changing lives. That's awesome. I just provide a platform and an for opportunity them. for them to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it's, I support them. And mm-hmm. you know, we started a, a church program at the jail too. So yes, on Thursdays we have three or four services. Different uh, pastors and churches from mm-hmm. different Holmes County come in and minister, and uh, we get a lot of compliments. I got a letter from an a inmate in jail just this week telling us, you know, how much he appreciated the opportunity to be able to do that and how it's changed his life, you know, because you never know when these people mm-hmm. come in jail haven't never been to church, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, haven't not had that, that exposure. Right, and you never know what it's going to do to change them, yeah. you know what I mean, but they're they're not forced to go. It's willingly. You, I mean, if you, if you want to go, you can. But uh, just yesterday in one service, we had 45 inmates in there. Goodness. So, uh, you know, you never know who you, where your next success next, story yeah. is going to be. Well I, well, I just hope that we continue to see those success uh, stories. Uh, it, it's so important for people to have hope when, mm-hmm. when they're, they're down. You know, I just want to encourage people, don't wait till you go to jail to ask yeah, for help. You know, exactly. Because don't, don't sit there and dig that hole so deep mm-hmm. that nobody can help you out of yeah. it. Uh, you know, if you if you need help, reach out before you get in trouble. Now, I also understand that you just completed the guardian uh, class for teachers in our county uh, school system. Can you tell us um, how 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 that went and how many guardian uh, guardians right. we have in our schools now? Yeah, um, after the merger of Stoneman Douglas shooting, the legislature enacted the the guardian program for all the all the district schools. To be able to participate in, mm-hmm. and we jumped in there right when it, they uh, allowed us to to begin it with, uh, and we had uh, I'm not sure on the numbers 10 or 15 to start with, mm-hmm. but some of them have left and retired. So the second round, <coughs> we done a second round of guardians, okay. and we just completed it. Uh, I say we, uh, my staff done most of the training, mm-hmm. um, but we they completed it about a month ago probably, and uh, all together now in Holmes County we have 22. Uh, faculty teachers in Holmes County that are licensed and car- and able to carry concealed on school campus along with the SROs. And you have to be so proactive. We hope nothing 
never happens in our school system like that, but you just have to prepare people, don't you? You do, and you got to be ready. And and I always I tell them, I told them, you know, when we was doing the swearing in to them and all, you know, we never hope it happens, but you know, when you, I've been in situations in the county where you know you've had to fight and you've mm-hmm. had you know tense situations, and when you got other people there with you, right, uh, it makes you feel a whole lot better than you're there by yourself. Absolutely. So if something bad does happen at school. It's more comforting to know that you got more than one person there yes. with a gun, and hopefully can you know eliminate the threat before you know it too happens. much bad happens. Yes, and and we, and we know that that happens frequently in our country. And uh, just thank you for for the education and um, and like I said, I hope we don't never have to. We hope they never have to use that training. Right. Um. Now on July first, the constitutional carry law will go into effect. Uh, can you educate us on that, and and then, and then, uh, you know, maybe how how it will pertain to our business owners here in Holmes County? Yeah. So this legislation, uh, Governor DeSantis passed the uh, constitutional carry uh, as of July first. What that means is basically, um, law-abiding citizens that are able to possess a firearm will no longer have to have a concealed weapons permit okay. to carry. In the state of Florida, uh, so what that means is, as long as you're not a convicted felon, uh, you don't have an injunction in place, and you're 21 years of age mm-hmm. or older, uh, you uh, you can possess a firearm, you can tote it concealed, and what that means is, everybody you know knows what concealed is. You can't see it with a naked eye. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't mean you can walk in the auto parts place open carry with it in a holster. You have to have your shirt over it, right? Uh, so it it isn't visible. Um, now. Uh, I, I teach this in my concealed weapons classes uh, that, you know, just because it says that you can tote concealed mm-hmm. does not mean that you can go into a private business, say a private business or some kind of restaurant that's private property. So, you know, those people that own that property is no different in your house. Okay. They have they can set the rules as they see it, mm-hmm. uh, just like you can at your house. So basically, if they say, hey, we don't want people in here with guns. They can they can regulate that. What I tell people in my class is basically, if you're toting concealed when nobody can see it, odds are they're never gonna they're ne- not gonna see it. You know what I'm saying? So that's not gonna be a problem. But I just want to caution people: if by chance that some business does come up to you and see that you do carry concealed and ask you to leave or go put your gun in the car, you got to do what they ask you to do. You know, they could call the law and they could have you trespassed or removed from the property. And if you uh, if you start arguing and fussing and whatever, now you're trespassing with a firearm, mm-hmm. which is a felony. Okay. So basically, one of the, the, the gist of the story is, you know, if you tote it like you're supposed to, number one, they're never going to know it. But if they do and they ask you to go put it in the truck or ask you to leave, then you, you need to comply. You need to cooperate, don't you? Right. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, thank you for that education because I know so you can hear so many different variations about what a law means. So thank you for the clarification on that. And uh, one other thing on the law is, too, is, you know, that's just for the state of Florida. Now, mm-hmm. Alabama has the same constitutional carry, so it applies up there also. Okay. But you may go into a state where they don't have constitutional carry, but you have to have a permit. So if you're a Florida resident and you go into one of those states that okay. have to have a permit, you have to have a permit. When you go into the state of Alabama and everybody knows the county roads going up to Dothan, the speed limit changes to 40 or 45, yes. you've got to obey what yes. that law is. Mm-hmm. So if you go into another state and they ha- don't have the constitutional carry law, right. you've got to obey what their law is. We're just covering a lot of subjects mm-hmm. tonight, um, and, and scams are just everywhere now. Uh, right. As someone is always wanting to separate you from your money, uh, every, any way they can do it. Uh, what are some of the latest scams going on uh, in our communities? Uh, we get a lot of calls on people who say they're receiving calls from the sheriff's office saying they have a warrant on them or they mm-hmm. have some kind of thing that they need to pay money to take care right. of. We don't call people and tell them they got warrants. Mm-hmm. Uh, n- number one, we'll go knock on their door and let them know that they have a warrant and exactly. we'll, we'll take care of it that way. <laughs> Um, we do post on Facebook sometimes if we do our drug roundup or something that these people have warrants, uh-huh. but we'll never call you on the phone and tell you you got a warrant or ask you to pay money in lieu of a warrant. Okay. So if you get one of those phone calls, it's fake. It's a scam. Don't give them any money. Don't give them any information. And if you have any questions, just call us. Mm-hmm. Um, on that one, there's a grandparent scam. Uh, yes, I, I've known several people who have uh, 
um, who have lost a lot of money uh, trying to get a grand grandchild uh, um, out of jail so that it won't be on their record. Right. I, I, is this is this is the same one? Yeah, uh, we've had them where they've called and you know that makes them sound like the grandparent or mm -hmm. the grand. Uh, child mm -hmm. in jail or in a bad wreck. We've uh -huh. had that and saying that hey, they need X amount of dollars to the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, if that happens, pick up the phone and call your grandkid before yeah. you do anything. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, because I, uh, I can tell you that we've had it happen numerous times, and people have called the grandchild and said he's fine. You know, so if you get that phone call before you give them anything, call your grandchild, granddaughter, grandson, or whatever, and just talk to mm -hmm. them because you'll find out it's a scam. Yeah. Uh, and and let's see, there, there's another one involving property. I, I, did, I think. Yeah, well, now. this is a kind of a new one to us. We've seen, but I think it's been going around other places. But uh, you know, basically, people can when you list or they'll they'll go on somewhere and see your property or something, and they'll list it for sale. Oh, and goodness. a lot of people will buy a property sight unseen and not ask about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and pay cash. So what they'll do, they'll list it on the internet as for sale and they'll you know talk with them and they'll send them the cash and to find and come to find no out property. that they never owned it oh my goodness so and a lot of these scams are, are happening overseas and it's hard to track them and it's hard to mm -hmm. you know be able to find out or make an arrest on them in anything to separate that money from yeah. you right well you got to think about it. these people are sitting in a room probably like we are mm -hmm. with a phone with nothing to do for eight or ten hours a day but to call people Just and try to convince them to send them money so if they call one person and they convince that person to send them $1,000 that day, they made $1,000 from nothing but on the yeah. phone. Yeah. And very seldom is the money ever recovered, is it? Right. A lot of times it's, it's do, done through green dot cards or through accounts that, that end up in another country somewhere. Now, you're getting ready for your junior deputy youth camp. Right. Uh, can you share a little bit about what's going to be going on? Um, yeah, we, uh, our school resource deputies during the summer put this camp on for the, the kids. And we do numerous things. We partner with... Uh, uh, North Side Assembly Church, uh, they help us out with it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think 4-H is going to help us out. And different entities come in and help. Uh, and we just we teach them things that law enforcement do. And we get the Child Advocacy Center come in and just talk about different things that's going on with kids, child abuse, different things to look for. And just try to educate the kids that, you know, uh, law enforcement is a little bit more than what you just see on TV. Uh -huh. uh, and we bring the helicopters in, EMS, medical personnel comes in, the prison with the dogs come in and show what they do. And we just try to bring a lot of variety of stuff in, uh, not only just to educate them, but just kind of, you know, that's our future. And, you know, one of the, some of them, hopefully, that go to camp will end up being a law enforcement officer or a paramedic yes. or something one day. Spark, spark that interest in that, in, in that child at a young age. Right. and. Uh, could be a, a future law enforcement of, officer. Uh, also, now I know we see a lot of work uh, uh, inmate uh, work groups that go out into the county. Uh, would you like to t share some something some about that tonight? Yeah, that's another good program that we you know we started uh, probably about two years ago. Um, I went to commissioners and told them I said you know hey we got. We got 100 some, 180 inmates in the jail. Let's put some of them to work out here cutting grass, and mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we we was able to negotiate. We we've got three three inmate work crews now. So what we do, and one of them we partnered with the city of Bonifay to help maintain the the right of ways on 79 and 90, and, mm -hmm. and cut all we can cut. Uh, but they do a lot of a lot of work. Um, one one crew is dedicated to the county. One crew is dedicated to the city of Bonifay. And the other crew, unfortunately, right now is helping build my office. So when they get through with that, they'll move on to something else. They, they like to get out. They like to work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it teaches them a trait. Uh, maybe one day when they get out, they'll go into lawn business or something, and you know, or carpentry or electrician or something. Uh, but it's a, it's a really good program, and we're proud of it. And, you know, uh, with the weather the way it is, it's it's hard to keep all the grass cut. So we try the best we can, but it, it was we probably could use three more. To be honest with you, during the, the summer months, oh, I'm to sure. try to keep all the grass cut. Well, and and on behalf of the Holmes County Chamber, we appreciate you y'all keeping our, the groups keeping our grass and yard looking really great. I know uh, 
when it rolls around to uh, rodeo time, y'all spend a lot of, uh, of a lot of time out there getting everything ready for the rodeo and our visitors. So, so it is much needed in our county and our city, and we appreciate you uh, coming up with that I- that great idea to u- to utilize that workforce. Yeah, I think you know uh, perceptions everything, so it, especially when rodeo comes into town. You know, first thing they're gonna look at is hey, if the grass is knee high, <laughs> you know. So we try to. We spent a lot, about four or five weeks there pre- oh, prepping do. for it yes. and uh, try to make it look good. Well, like I said, we do, we, you know, we just appreciate all all the things that 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 um, that does for uh, a lot of the non for profits and 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 our stadium everywhere. One thing I do want to do is brag on my staff. We have uh, about seventy two employees. That's from me all the way down to dispatch to the jail to everything. And you know, we have a, a great group of people. Uh, are we perfect? No, we're not. You know, we make mistakes, but t- out of the total circumstances, if everything that's happened while well, I've been sheriff, uh, you won't find a greater uh, group of people that come together when things happen. Uh, for example, today when the storms come through, uh, mm-hmm. everybody got out, everybody started riding, going to these calls, and mm-hmm. the inmate work crews grabbed chainsaws. We started cutting trees out of the road, and, you know, we just – we work all together with different entities, the fire departments, you know, EMS, different different people. And uh, during Hurricane Michael, was the same thing. Yes. Um, it's just when catastrophes happen, um, they, they they buckle down and they give it 110 um, percent. And it, there's not one entity, patrol investigations or mm-hmm. the jail, that is greater than the other. It takes everybody as a team to work yes, together. Yes, it, it to truly does. It. Sheriff Tate, I just want to thank you. Uh, for your leadership and uh, your dedication to our county and community. And uh, please uh, let your staff know just how much that they are thought of and how much they are appreciated in our county. Thank you. Thank you all for having me tonight. And that'll do it for this episode of Chats with the Chamber Lady. This is Donna Meldon with the Holmes County Chamber of Commerce, and this has been Chats with the Chamber Lady. And remember, if you need it, or you want it, or you want to do it. Holmes County has got everything for you. Thank you so much.